64,000 is the median number of words per book. Average person reads about 200 words per minute. Simple math will tell us that is one book in 320 minutes. To accomplish this in seven days, numbers say you would have to read for 45 minutes a day. Don't forget to subscribe. Hit that notification button, like, comment, and share. Enjoy. Hello, and happy day. How does slowing down sound to you today? Would you like to reduce the noise for just a bit? Are you ready to make a choice and decide to listen? My name is Igor S.F. Walker, and I'm here to remind people to slow down, to reduce the noise, to walk their lives into a natural flow. Welcome back to the Book of the Week series. Every week, as I read another amazing title, I share it with the world. Today, we look at debt. The first 5,000 years by David Graeber. In this video, we will look at what is debt? Where does the language of debt come from? And how does it apply to everyday life? History of debt and debt through history. Is this a question of morality? Or is it actually something evil? Are we actually in debt to the universe and life itself? Looking at the links between religion, payment, and the mediation of the sacred and profound realms by money. How is it that moral obligations between people come to be thought of as debt, and as a result, end up justifying behavior that would otherwise seem utterly immoral. So stick around until the end, and I will share with you a way to explore the mystery of yourself and your personality. How to find out why you do the things you do. What are the hidden motivators behind the scenes, these innate human needs we are sometimes not even consciously aware of? Debt. A noun. Number one. A sum of money owed. Number two, the state of owing money. And number three, a feeling of gratitude for a favor or a service. This is Oxford English Dictionary. If you owe the bank $100,000, the bank owns you. If you owe the bank $100 million, you own the bank. American proverb. Actually, the remarkable thing about the statement, one has to pay one's debts, is that even according to the standard economic theory, it isn't really true. A lender is supposed to accept a certain degree of risk. If all loans, no matter how idiotic, were still retrievable, if there were no bankruptcy laws, for instance, the results would be disastrous. Sounds like common sense, but the funny thing is, economically, that's not how loans are actually supposed to work. Financial institutions are supposed to be ways of directing resources towards profitable investments. If a bank were guaranteed to get its money back, plus interest, no matter what it did, the whole system wouldn't really work. The very fact that we don't know what debt is, the very flexibility of the concept, is the basis of its power. If history shows anything, it is that there is no better way to justify relations founded on violence, to make such relations seem moral, than by reframing them in the language of debt. Above all, because it immediately makes it seem that it is the victim who's doing something wrong. Mafiosi understand this. So do the commanders of conquering armies for thousands of years. Violent men have been able to tell their victims that those victims owe them something. If nothing else, they owed them their lives, because they haven't been killed. For the last 5,000 years, with remarkable regularity, 
popular insurrections have begun the same way, with the ritual destruction of the dead records. Tablets, papyri, ledgers, whatever form they might have taken in any particular time and place. After that, rebels usually go after the records of land holding and tax assessments. As the great classicist Moses Finley often liked to say, in the ancient world, all revolutionary movements had a single program, cancel the debts and redistribute the land. Terms like reckoning or redemption are only the most obvious, since they're taken directly from the language of ancient finance. In a larger sense, the same could be said of guilt, freedom, forgiveness, and even sin. Arguments about who really owes what to who have played a central role in shaping our basic vocabulary of right and wrong. After all, to argue with the king, one has to use king's language. Whether or not the initial premises make sense, if one looks at the history of debt, then what one discovers, first of all, is profound moral confusion. The majority of human beings hold simultaneously that, number one, paying back money one has borrowed is a simple matter of morality, and number two, anyone in the habit of lending money is evil. What precisely does it mean to say that our sense of morality and justice is reduced to the language of a business deal? What does it mean when we reduce moral obligations to debts? What changes when the one turns into the other? And how do we speak about them when our language has been so shaped by the market? Economists generally speak of three functions of money medium of exchange, unit of account, and store of value. All economic textbooks treat the first one as the primary. Human nature does not drive us to tuck and barter. Rather, it ensures that we are always in crea creating symbols, such as money itself. This is how we come to see ourselves in the cosmos surrounded by the invisible forces, as in debt to the universe. The primordial debt, writes the British sociologist Jeffrey Ingham, is that owed by the living to the continuity and durability of the society that secures their individual existence. In this sense, it is not just criminals who owe a debt to society. We are all in a certain sense, guilty, even criminals. In all Indo-European languages, words for debt are synonymous with those for sin or guilt, illustrating the links between religion, payment, and the mediation of the sacred and profound realms by money. Perhaps what the authors of the Brahmas were really demonstrating was that in the final analysis, our relation with the cosmos is ultimately nothing like a commercial transaction, nor could it be. That is because commercial transactions imply both equality and separation. These examples are all about overcoming separation. You are free from your debt from your ancestors when you become an ancestor. You are free from your debt to the sages when you become a sage. You are free to your debt, from your debt to humanity, when you act with humanity. All the more so if one is speaking of the universe. If you cannot bargain with the gods, because they already have everything, then you certainly cannot bargain with the universe, because universe is everything, and that everything necessarily includes yourself. One could, in fact, interpret this that the only way of freeing oneself from debt was not literally repaying debts, but rather showing that these debts do not exist. 
because one is not in fact separate to begin with and hence the very notion of cancelling the debt and achieving a separate autonomous existence was ridiculous from the start. This is a great trap from the 20th century. On one side there's the logic of the market, that we like to imagine that we all start out as individuals who don't owe each other anything. On the other there's the logic of the state. We all begin with the debt we can never truly pay. We're constantly told that they are opposites and that between them they contain the only real human possibilities. But it's a false dichotomy. States created markets. Markets require states. Neither could continue without the other, at least in anything like the forms we would recognize today. Markets aren't real. They are mathematical models created by imagining a self-contained world where everyone has exactly the same motivation and the same knowledge and is engaged in the same self-interested calculated exchange. Economists are aware that reality is always more complicated, but they're also aware that to come up with the mathematical models one always has to make the world into a bit of a bit of a cartoon. There's nothing wrong with this. The problem comes when it enables some, often those same economists, to declare that anyone who ignores the dictates of the market shall surely be punished. Or that since we live in a market system, everything except government interference is based on principle of justice. That our economic system is one vast network of reciprocal relations in which in the end, the accounts balance and all debts are paid. How is it that moral obligation between people came to be thought of as debt and as a result end up, ended up justifying behavior that would otherwise seem utterly immoral? The answer, by making a distinction between commercial economies and human economies, that is those where money acts primarily as a social currency, to create, maintain, or sever relationships between people rather than to purchase things. As Rasphobi so congently gem demonstrated, it is the peculiar quality of such social currencies that they are never quite equivalent to people. If anything, they are constant reminder that human beings can never be equivalent to anything, even ultimately to one another. Historically, war, states, and markets all tend to feed off of one another. Conquests leads to taxes. Taxes tend to be ways to create markets which are convenient for soldiers and administrators. In the specific case of Mesopotamia, origins of patriarchy, all of this created a complicated relation and an explosion of debt that threatened to turn all human relations and, by extension, women's bodies into potential commodities. At the same time, it created a horrifying reaction on the part of the male winners of the economic game, who over time felt forced to go to greater and greater lengths to make it clear that their women could in no sense be bought or sold. Freedom is the natural faculty to do whatever one wishes that is not prevented by force or law. Slavery is an institution according to the law of nations, whereby one person becomes private property, dominion of another, contrary to nature. Government was essentially a contract, a kind of a business agreement, whereby citizens had voluntarily given up some of their natural liberties to the sovereign. Finally, Similar ideas have become the basis of the most basic dominant institution of our present economic life, wage labor, which is effectively the renting of our freedom in the same way that slavery can be conceived as its sale. It is not only our freedom that we own. The same logic has come to be applied even to our bodies, which are treated in such relations 
and treated no, really no different than houses, homes or furniture. We own ourselves. Therefore, outsiders have no right to trespass on us. Debt had two possible outcomes. The first was that the aristocrats could win and the poor remained slaves to the rich, which in practice meant that most people would end up clients of some wealthy patron. Such states were generally militarily ineffective. The second was that the popular fraction could prevail, institute the usual popular program of redistribution of lands and safeguards of debt peonage, and thus create the basis for class of free farmers, whose children would in turn be free to spend much of their time training for war. The modern banking system manufactures money out of nothing. The process is perhaps the most astounding piece of slay of hand that was ever invented. Banking was conceived in inequity and born in sin. Bankers own the earth. Take it away from them, but leave them with the power to create credit, and with the stroke of a pen they will create enough money to buy it back again. If you wish to remain slaves of bankers and pay the cost of your own slavery, let them continue to allow to create deposits. We will put in a good word for the non-industrious poor. At least they aren't hurting anyone in so far as the time they're taking off from work is being spent with friends and family, enjoying and caring for those they love. They're probably improving the world more than we acknowledge. Maybe we should think of them as the pioneers of a new economic order that would not share our current one's pension for self-annihilation. It seems to me that we are long overdue for some kind of a biblical-style jubilee, one that would affect both international debt and consumer debt. It would be solitary, not just because it would relieve so much genuine human suffering, but also because it would be our way of reminding ourselves that money is not ineffable, that paying one's debt is not the essence of morality, that all these things are human arrangements, and that if democracy is to mean anything, it is the ability to all agree to arrange things in a different way. What is that anyway? What is debt anyway? It's just a provision of a promise. If our promise, it is a promise that is corrupted by both math and violence. Freedom, real freedom, is the ability to make friends. Then it is also the necessary, the ability to make real promises. What sort of promises might genuine free men and women make to one another? At this point, we can't even say. It is more a question of how we can go to a place that will allow us to find out. And the first step in that journey, it turns, is to accept that in the largest scheme of things, just as no one has the right to tell us our true value, no one has the right to tell us what we truly owe. And there you have it. Please do help out. It is easy. Simply like this video so more people can enjoy it. Share it too and spread the word. Leave a comment and share your thoughts. Subscribe to my channel and stay up to date. And the link to this book is in the description below. So buy it and read. Never stop learning. Especially learning about yourself and nature. So gift yourself by taking the free human needs test on my website and find out what actually motivates you. What innate human need is driving all of your decisions and your behavior. And if you feel you are ready to improve your self-awareness, social awareness, self-management and relationship management even further, do check out my Master of Life Awareness program. The links are in the description below. Thank you. Love and respect.